We just saw survey scores about whether we were ready to have AI or trust AI with our treatment decisions. Um, and it would take 10 years. So um, that might be true, but I think what we are ready to do today is trust AI and algorithms to help us learn. Okay? And I, this is really fundamental. We need to be able to, to use these things to help us learn. So what I mean by this, let me contrast this to where we are with the state of something like physics. What you see here is an image taken after um, and the Large Hadron Collider, one of the many images that came about when we announced the discovery of the Higgs boson, the God particle, right? So this discovery came about because somebody theorized 30 years ago or so that there was a God particle, and then physicists got together and built the largest machine for collecting massive amounts of data and then using algorithms to analyze those data to be able to verify and make this prediction. That's currently not the state of medicine. It's the reason why I went into medicine and biology in the first place, was to bring algorithms and machine learning approaches to help us learn so we can go beyond thinking about biology and data as this empirical cataloging exercise and actually start to make predictions about our health and disease very accurately down to the individual and to be precise and not mostly be wrong, right? We hear about instances where we're mostly wrong. 90% of drugs fail in clinical trials. We're wrong a lot. We can't afford that anymore. And every time I see something like this, I'm really disheartened. <laughs> you know, you do a study, coffee causes something, leads to maybe twins. Uh, so we want to put an end to this. Okay. So how do we do that? Um, so earlier we heard about the abilities now to collect data, and it's all kinds of data, from entire genomes to molecular profiles that span lipidomics, proteomics, uh, hopefully health measures and other kinds of health measures, as Alex talked about. And what we want to do is take that data and start to reconstruct and learn what are the underlying drivers of the system. How your genome, along with environmental factors and any other factors we can collect on you, can then start to influence and reconstruct and learn a molecular circuitry that then influences your phenome. And part of what we measure might be causal for your disease, for your health, and part of it might be reactive. And we need to know which is which if we want to be able to intervene. We need to be able to intervene on what's causal. And what's reactive are the things that we can observe that can help us diagnose what's happening over time. So this is the goal. So how do we get there? Well, a little bit of mathematics lesson. I promise, I think these are the only equations I have in my talk. Um, the first is we can start to look at data as just a set of correlations, a set of patterns, what we can recognize. But the problem with correlations is we can't sort out cause. And you can just look at this simple uh, graph on the left here, which shows does A drive B or B drive A? And those two probabilities are mathematically indistinguishable, but we can look at the right, and we can start to learn causality by collecting things that orient the system, right? We apply interventions, so there's real-world things that we can apply to patients, whether it's the drugs that they're on, um, other kinds of interventions, and that can then drive something, a change, that then drives something else. And you can look at whether C drives A then drives B, or you can ask, is it the other way around? Is it C driving B then A? And those probabilities, those models, those graphs are different, and we can use data to test to score those models and figure out what's the most likely scenario, what's the most likely mechanism driving and underlying the system so we can learn. All right. So we want to do this at scale, and this is where the machines come in, because we're not going to do these computations on pen and paper or, or on a calculator. We're actually going to go in and start to then enumerate and learn of all the possible ways these things can interact with each other and start to piece it together in a causal network that links genomes to molecular phenomes to your phenomes to physiology. And we're not going to just learn one model of the system, but we're going to learn a cloud of models where once we learn that cloud of models, we can start to run simulations and ask very precise what-if questions. What happens if I enter your genome into this algorithm? What I predict about your outcome? And I'm not going to get a precise answer. That's not where we are today. But I'm going to get an answer with a confidence metrics around it. And back to the theme earlier, as I collect more data, those confidence will get tighter and tighter. And I can learn that. I can learn how confident I am in what I'm predicting and use that as part of the decisions I make when making a prediction. So here's an example of data that we took from hundreds of patients, where for each patient, and at the time we did this analysis, we had hundreds. Today we have a couple of thousand. But for each patient, we measured whole genome. 
RNA molecular profiles, proteomic profiles in the thousands, lipidomic profiles, metabolomics, coronary artery disease readouts measured by imaging. Okay, so lots of data, trillions and trillions of data points over hundreds of people, and ran that through the reverse engineering engine that had to learn and sample trillions of network fragments, billions of networks before it came up with this ensemble of models. And then once it generated those models, we could run simulations, do what if scenario simulations. This is really key because we want to be able to the algorithm to predict things that go beyond the data itself. Um, and we came up with 10 billion pairwise causal assertions. And this is what it looks like, a nice cartoon of it, because we as humans still need visuals in terms of what these algorithms do. But what the cartoon starts to show you, or the map, is what we inferred about how different genetic variation in these patients are changing molecular variables to phonetic variables. And we can go up close here. And what the algorithm predicted is what was downstream of statins, PCSK9. So these are some of the measures that were taken in the patients. And it actually got the direction correctly. There was a lot of papers that had controversy as where PCSK9 stood with statin. Through causal machine learning, we can get the directionality right and predict that it's downstream. We also uncover new targets in this and orient them relative to things that we do know, like cholesterol. Here's another example of what's possible today and what we can learn from patient data. So the output, and I'll talk about how I got to the output in just a second, are simulations here. This is a simulation, and each circle is a patient of what the algorithm is predicting in silica. So to get to this output, we went to 1,500 multiple myeloma patients. These were newly diagnosed patients. And for each patient, we did whole genome sequencing on their tumor biopsies, collected RNA data, clinical data longitudinally over time. Yes, it's a pain to get this data. But once you get it, we can start to tease out and learn the causal mechanisms driving the disease progression of these newly diagnosed patients. And then the model allows us to run simulations, queries where I can change the intervention. And in fact, this intervention simulation that was done here was a very specific question that a patient in the study asked us. He was a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patient, and he wanted to know if he should or should not be put on stem cell therapy. So stem cell therapy actually works really well. We've done studies, and that show on average, it will increase your overall survival. But that's on average, not specific to the individual. He wanted to know if it was worth it for him, given the molecular drivers of his disease. And there are costs associated with doing the therapy, and there's also a cost of not working. So that patient, there is a node there, and what we learned is that across all of these patients, there were actually two subpopulations. So yes, it works well on average, but there are some patients where it works really well for, and some where it doesn't. Okay. So this is just the result of the algorithm. We still have to go in and validate it, and we did. We actually went to our friends at Dana-Farber, some of whom are here in the audience today. Uh, and we said, can we check these results against your clinical cohorts? And they actually pan out, and the mechanisms that were derived, that were learned directly from the algorithm, actually predict really well. Okay? And this mechanism, this learning, happened because we took the effort to collect the data. And then within 90 days, my engineer ran this data through the algorithms to produce this prediction. So really, my hope and goal when we talk about are we ready to trust AI and machine learning, 10 years, I want to speed that up. I don't want it to be 10 years. I want it to be a couple of years. And I want to be able to get answers back to patients really, really quickly. So to end, uh, when I started doing this from theoretical physics to biology, uh, it will be 20 years soon, uh, I went in with just like I had this hunger I wanted to know. I wanted to understand biology in a very mechanistic way and to speed up how we learn it. But as I get older, <laughs> a couple of decades later, I'm, I'm now in it for very selfish reasons. I actually want to figure out how we can use it to hopefully live longer and impact my life today um, and see that trajectory out and maybe pause it like two, two women down, <laughs> like somewhere in the middle and just stay there for a very long time. All right, so thank you very much. <laughs>